Father, thank you for letting us be here for this morning, this rich time of worship, Lord, all that we get to do today as a community. Be with us, Lord, now as we open your scripture. I pray this in your name. Amen. So Colossians 1, we, we've been going through this book of Colossians, and we're asking this question, the, the central question of Colossians, that Jesus is the preeminent one. Jesus is the one who's supreme in the church, in our lives, and in the world. And today, that is what we're going to see. So instead of giving an additional instruction or introduction about this, we're just going to jump right into the text in Colossians 1. Let me read this to us. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." There is just no way, especially because we got hamburgers coming, but there's no way that I could even begin to scratch the surface of everything that Paul just told us in this text. So my hope for us this morning is that like, we can walk away and have a more fuller understanding of what it means that Jesus is the preeminent one in all of these areas that Paul talked to us about, that our, that our vision and our view of what that means would grow, because we can't mine the depths. Again, even if we didn't have lunch today, we, we don't have enough time you know, to do this in one sermon. So we're going to look, and and again, hopefully we walk away with a fuller view of what it means that Jesus is preeminent. Because I think that what most of us would do, and that most, mostly what we're taught, and I think the way that we often live, is we are happy to accept, or we've thought of God's preeminence only in terms of the second part of the passage I just read to you. Like, we'd be perfectly happy thinking of God's preeminence, Jesus' supremacy, in terms of the fact that we who were once sinners, you know, we who were once doing evil against God, we who were doing all those things, have now been made holy and blameless in Christ. And we, we would look at it purely through that lens. But we would skip over the first section that talks about Jesus being above all things, being before all things, being the creator of the universe. We haven't actually thought about how our faith impacts those areas of our lives. And so, my, again, my hope for us today is to not leave anything behind, but be able to scratch the surface and understand this. And so the first, what we're going to do is this, because this is what Paul does. He starts really broad in terms of Jesus' preeminence, and then he comes really narrow. So he starts with a broad area, he comes narrow, and then we're going to do that. We're going to go broad, come narrow, and then we're going to go back out to consider the implications. So we're going to go broad, bring it down to the narrow view of us as individuals, and then go out broad again to consider the implications. Because here's what Paul said. And, and again, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm overly simplifying what's going on in this passage. But I think it'll help us understand, because what Paul said, uh, that the gospel, and we have to always come back to this, the gospel, the way he uses the word, the truth, he's saying the gospel is about the way things really are. It's not just a true statement, it's about the way things really are. And so if it's the way things really are, then we want to understand, it like this, that the gospel is a, it's a comprehensive change to the way that we view everything in our lives. And so we want to know why, why, what, what makes it so comprehensive. So very broadly speaking, Paul talks about three spheres, and I'm going to call them spheres of sovereignty, three spheres in this passage. First of all, the sphere of all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold, hold together. He's called the firstborn. It doesn't mean like he's the first one created. The word, the word firstborn, the way that it's used here, is more like in the child of a sovereign ruler who's going to receive the inheritance. Like he, like he is the one who is due all the glory, all the supremacy, all the honor is him. It's, it's a play on the idea of preeminence. And you can see this because Paul goes on to say that Jesus, all things were created through Jesus, and all things are created for Jesus. In other words, he's the causal agent of all of creation, but he's also the one who receives all the glory from that creation. He is the one for whom 
all creation has been made. So John, in his letter about Jesus' life, or in his account of Jesus' life, begins with that phrase that we've heard. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing has been made that was not made through him. You know, and, and this, is, this is, he's talking about Jesus. And that's typically the place we go. But this is actually all throughout the New Testament, including here. That Jesus was, in the beginning, the firstborn over all creation, so that nothing was made in the heavens and the earth that weren't made through him. Visible, invisible, and then he goes on and talks about, you know, rulers, authorities, positions, thrones. Not just, like, the kingly stuff, you know, kings and royalties and, pol- and politicians and leadership in the world that we see today. But he's actually referring to the, the demonic forces in the world. The, those, those seat of authority in the world that go against Christ and his mission. So all of this, all of it comes from him. Not that Christ created those demons, but that he has authority over all of this. And so uh, Jesus is the head that holds the whole thing together. Um, you know, this is, or uh, Paul says this, uh, that he's before all things and in him all things hold together. So he adds that little line. So it's not, not just that all things were created through, by Jesus, not that all were created for Jesus, but that Jesus is the one who actually holds it all together. That Jesus is also the one who's sustaining it. Now that's so foundational uh, of who Jesus is, that Paul's going to continue to highlight it here elsewhere, and you can't separate what we believe about who Jesus was and what he accomplished from his position, not just as God, but as literally the creator of the heavens and earth who sustains and holds all things together, and that has profound implications we'll get to later. Second sphere, the first sphere was the creation, the second sphere is community or the church. Now again, we're being overly simplistic to make a point, but I want us to see this. He is the beginning, again, he repeats that, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In the New Testament, Jesus' resurrection is presented as the first fruits, or that he's the firstborn, he's the first one. Like, our, our life, our eternity, our new life in Christ is guaranteed, our future resurrection guaranteed, because Jesus has gotten out of the grave. That's how we are to view it. And so it's a similar sense, calling him the firstborn from the dead, the way that it was used before, is that he is the one who's defeated death, stands first in the line, of many offspring who will defeat death, and therefore he receives the glory from it. But here's, what, here's the term that I love, and it's, and it's right here. It says, in the beginning, right here when he's talking about the firstborn from the dead, Jesus is the beginning. See, I think we miss this when we look at the scripture, because we would expect the beginning of the story to be in the beginning. But what Paul is saying to us, and this is incredibly profound for the Christian life, is he's saying, actually, the beginning starts with Jesus. Now you say, why, does, why is that the beginning? Why, why is that the beginning when it's actually in the middle of the story, the way that we view it? Well, the reason is because this is the moment when the new creation and the new kingdom and all of these things have come into play. Everything that God always intended for the world begins with Jesus. You, you could make the case that everything that came before it was the prologue to the story. All of the creation, all of the Old Testament account, the account of God's people, and that's why it's so profound, because that everything that we believe is based on all of that. But when Jesus comes, he goes, Jesus is the beginning of the story. He is the beginning of the narrative that's playing out in your life where you follow Christ and you live as a part of his kingdom. We are now living in the reality of what God always intended for his people. That's an amazing promise. It's an aside. But he's saying... Uh, Jesus, this is the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth where Jesus reigns as king. You have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. So Jesus is the sovereign over the church, over the community. And finally, Jesus is sovereign over the individual. He says this, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And if indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Broad creation, church, community, individual. We've gone from the broad and come down to the narrow. You, those who are enemies of God, who are far from God, Jesus has reconciled in his flesh by his death. You've been forgiven in the reconciliation of Jesus. You've been restored to holiness and blameless. That's the reconciliation that has occurred in the life of the individual. So the question is how? If we start out with these spheres of sovereignty, what was the process of reconciliation and the instrument of reconciliation in Colossians and throughout the New Testament is the cross, verse 19 to 20. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven and on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
this is the center of the reconciliation effort. That Jesus, on the cross, bore the burdens of sin, reconciles all things in earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Reconciling all things. See, we've moved from the broad to the narrow, and right at the center, we see that the instrument of reconciliation was the cross. And Paul says it clearly, this is so important, all things. Our all things are being reconciled, but our temptation is that we just want to focus on the individual reconciliation that we're offered. And I say it's beyond just our temptation. I would say that the primary message of American Christianity is actually all about your individual reconciliation. And it's too narrow a view. And we miss what God is doing, what he has actually reconciled. Now, it's really important. The reconciliation of the individual is a big deal, but it's only one part of what occurred. Even if we think of it as the central piece of what occurred, it's only one part. It's not the whole story. It's a piece, it's a piece of bringing reconciliation, but it's not the whole story. And when we treat it like it is, we end up with a mentality, and let's see if you've seen this. Okay, when we treat just the individual reconciliation as if that's the whole story. What we do is we end up with a situation that says that we are saved and the rest of the world can go to hell. Like we're saved and the rest of the world can be left to their own devices. We are content to be reconciled to God personally, but we have no desire to see the rest of the world be reconciled around us. So look at the way that many Christians talk, right? We have this very, the world is so bad, it's sin, evil is taking over, and and it's very defeatist, but they come back and go, but at least I'm saved. Oh, well, world's bad, terrible. Hey, but I'm saved. Tough luck for the rest of these guys. We view the world like we were one of the lucky ones to get on the lifeboat as the Titanic was sinking. We got the life jacket. We got the lifeboat. We're floating out there just watching it. Well, too bad. Too bad for the rest of those people on that boat. They they should have done better. They should have gotten off like me. I wish they had gotten the message, you know. Even Rose floating out there on her on her door. She's thinking like it's fine. Sorry, Jack. Maybe if you had gotten on the door, gotten yourself one, you'd be fine. Everyone else can go down. But what if the cross, what if what Jesus accomplished wasn't about getting you in a lifeboat? What if the cross was about giving you the means and the tools? to fix the boat before it sank. It's a very different thing. What if the message of the good news was that Jesus had patched the hole that was caused by the iceberg of sin, and so instead of getting off the ship, you could actually go and begin to repair the damage that was caused because of the iceberg? What what if that's what the truth of the way things really are actually leads you to? Not you being off the boat going like, wow, that's too bad, it's sinking, but you staying on the boat and saying, "I, I actually can fix this. I have the means of repair. That in the cross, Jesus has reconciled all of this mess to himself. Your reconciliation, the reconciliation that Jesus brought in you through his body of flesh is a microcosm of the reconciliation effort that God is doing in the world, and that's the point. You who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled. And then look what happens because of the good news. This is what it means that Jesus is the beginning Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You see the connection. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In the very beginning, in the first pages of Genesis, we are described as being made in the image of God. We are the ones who have been stamped with God's glory and grandeur. We are the ones who have been called to bring what God has done in the garden God creates this garden, he cultivated it, he grows it, and he says to Adam and Eve, you is my image, go and make the rest of the world look like this garden. You are my glory, my presence in the world, called to take my glory to the ends of the earth. Adam and Eve blow it. We blow it. But now, in Christ, there is a new beginning, there is a new image that fully and magnificently reflects God himself and you are being transformed into it so that the mission you were always given can finally, you can do it now. That's why we say this is really the beginning of the story because now for the first time in your life, 
you have the opportunity to live into the mission that God always intended for you, to be the image of God in the world, to bring his glory to the ends of the earth, to reconcile the world to himself. This is the implication of this in our lives. But again, this isn't where reconciliation ends, it's where it begins. So now we work backwards. We've started in the cosmos, we've come to the narrow, now let's consider the implications for the narrow out to the broad. Implications for the individual. We've actually already read the implications for the individual. If Jesus is the supreme one, he says this. If, if, if Jesus, this is Paul's uh, teaching, if Jesus has reconciled you on the cross, if he is the preeminent one in your life, transferring you from being an enemy of God to being holy and blameless, then Paul says this is what will occur in you, that this, this transformation will continue to occur if, he says, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Faith is an ongoing process in our lives. Faith is the ongoing process of putting us in a position to continually grow. It's not a one-time event. Faith is about living into the reality that we've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. See, this is why, again, as we go back to this idea of conversion, where, where we narrow down the gospel to a truth statement, and we just say the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, when we narrow it down to that, then all we're looking for is conversion, but we're not looking forward to the change that will occur that Christ will bring about in you as a result of reconciling you in his cro on the cross. Paul's teaching on what is happening to the individual is instructive on what's going to happen elsewhere because it's not just about fixing what was wrong. He says to us, he goes, you were hostile to God, now you are holy and blameless, and this will be a process that goes on you. It's not just about what you were saved from, right? You weren't just saved from blindness and given sight. He goes, you were saved from the domain where blindness ruled to the domain where sight rules, where light rules, where you can see. There's a process that's going to happen as you learn to live in this new kingdom, and that's not just true for individuals, but it's true for the church. So we start with the individual. What are the implications? That you will be continually transformed into the likeness of Christ, who, of whom now is the image of God, through whom all things were created. But then we think about the church. Paul says that Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. This is frightening. What, Jesus, what Paul's saying is that the church is now... so. Us, sitting in this room, okay, all people who call Christ their Savior, the church is the visible manifestation of the reconciliation that's happening in all of creation. That was a lot of rhyming. I didn't mean to do that, but let me read it again because that was awesome. All right. The church is the visible manifestation of the reconciliation that is happening in all of creation. Whew. That was a good line. Boom. Boom. I didn't even mean to do that. That's the Holy Spirit right there. All right. Think about that, though. Think about what Paul's saying. It, see, it's not just, you remember the song, they will know we are Christians by our love? It's not just that they know we're Christians. What they're going to know is that God has the power to reconcile the entirety of the cosmos. That when, when people view you, the church, they're going to know that God has the ability to reconcile the entirety of the cosmos because when people look at you, they should say, if God can reconcile those people, then what can't he do? I mean, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying the, the reconciliation that's going to be so profound within the community of the church because Jesus is the preeminent one in the church will be so insane to the world watching you that the world's going to say, if God can bring those people together, then he can bring anybody. He can do anything. I'd go so far as to say that the harder problem is the reconciliation of people like you and me than reconciling the cosmos. This is why we have to be so careful not to bring the divisiveness of the world into the community of the church. See, we have to be really careful because most of the time it happens and we don't even know it's happening. It's just that we've been so influenced by outside voices, that we've been so influenced by what Paul is going to call deceit. We're not the first church to deal with this. He says to the Colossians multiple times, as we'll see moving forward, he says, the reason I am sharing with you so confidently about the gospel, the reason I want you to be rooted in Christ is what he says, is so that you will not fall victim to arguments that sound good but are actually lies. And he says it multiple times. He goes, a lot of you have believed, not you, but the Colossian church, let's just blame it on them. A lot of the people in the Colossian church 
had believed lies, which sounded really good, but he goes, but they're from the devil. And some of them were flowing from religious leaders, okay? Some of them were flowing from culture. Some of them were flowing from government. And he's saying to them, I am telling you the gospel because I'm telling you Jesus is preeminent and that you need to be rooted in him so that you don't fall victim to that. But here's the reality. I've said this over the past like two years, or I commiserate about this with my pastor friends, and I have nothing to complain about because Paul is writing from prison, so whatever. It's worse for him. You know, my pastor friends, and I, you know, we have, there's 168 hours in a week. I have 30 minutes to share the gospel with you to help focus you on what God is saying to you, to help you examine culture and reality through the lens of the scripture. But then you leave and have 167 and a half hours to fill your mind with whatever else you choose. Most of which is going directly contrary to what God's word says, whether it's you go home and you turn on your favorite news station, whether you go home and you go on social media into that vacuum of garbage in which only people who agree with you are the voices that you hear. What 167 and a half hours to undo the 30 minutes that you have when you gather around God's word proclaimed. Because listen, the reality is even if you are the type of person who, who reads your Bible every day, and I know that for most of us, this is the most focused Bible study we have all week. I'm, I'm not blind to the reality. This 30 minutes is the most 30 minutes of focused Bible study that we have in our whole week. But even if you read the Bible, it still amounts to a small fraction of the influence of things that are happening in your mind. Small fraction. I can't tell you how many times, again, this past year, past, I talk to pastors and we call and commiserate because we discover that someone in the church has left because I'm just, well, the pastor has gotten too political. And what they, or, the, well, maybe he's not political enough. Well, I left because the pastor wouldn't endorse a candidate. But those pastors, they're just trying to preach from the Bible. And sometimes the problem is that the biblical view where Jesus is the preeminent one conflicts with everything else you're hearing for 167 and a half hours a week. And see, well, so what do we, so we choose the 167 and a half hours. And we let politics or other views on the world divide us. We go, I can't even worship with those people anymore because they disagree with me on, on some point. That, so what's preeminent then in the church? If we're going to walk away over differences in how we view society or how we've experienced the world, if we're going to walk away over that, then Jesus is not preeminent in the church. But what are you filling your mind with? This is why Paul's going to say it. He's going to say the arguments that you hear sound plausible, but they're deceit. The church is the example of Christ's preeminence in the world, and we need to be careful that we don't allow the enemy in the world to knock Jesus from the place of preeminence in the church. Which leads us to the last thing. Implications for the cosmos. See, God, or the creation. See, God has renewed the mission, renewed the beginning of the story, and this time he's placed the ultimate image bearer, God himself, in the center. So the reconciliation project goes beyond just the individuals or our communities. It applies to our world. It applies to everything that we do. This is why Abraham Kuyper, who was not only a, a Dutch minister around the turn of the 20th century, but he was also a, a, he was the prime minister of the Netherlands, and he said this quote, many people have heard it before. He says, there's not a square inch of the whole domain in which, uh, of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord of all, declares, this is mine. But in fact, there's, that's the phrase that people know, but he begins by saying, he's like, you can't have a duplicitous mind. He goes, you can't think about the world in terms of, well, Christ rules this area as if it's my private faith, but he doesn't rule the rest of the world. He says, so you can't have a duplicitousness of mind in terms of thinking about where Christ is Lord. And then he goes on to say, because there's not one square inch in the whole creation over which God, who's sovereign over all, does not say this is mine. If God in Christ is reconciling all things, the heavens and the earth, then by its very nature, the gospel that we proclaim about the way things really are 
is a gospel that is comprehensive of and not exclusive of the world around us. And this is what happened to the early church. See, the early church began living in such strong community that the reconciliation was happening where they go, hey, there's going to be no one amongst us who has need. We're going to live in community. It was so powerful that as those communities expanded and grew, the world around them was transformed. And I know sometimes we don't think about how the world was transformed over the last 2,000 years as a result of the church, but it, it, it is radical transformation that has happened, almost all of it stemming from the influence of Christ, who is preeminent in, in our lives as individuals, in the church, and ultimately in the world. It changed, the economy changed. I mean, we're going to look at this in the book of Colossians, because Paul writes a letter to a member of the church. His name was Philemon. Paul writes a letter to him because he says, hey, here's something you have to wrestle with, because in the New Testament and in the first century, slavery or bond servanthood was not the way that we think about it in terms of the evils in America, where we, you know, slavery was an institution of owning a brother and sister. Uh, the slavery in the New Testament is primarily talked about in terms of an economic system whereby I can basically hand over my economic rights to you to pay back what I owe you. So I could, for example, if I owe you money, say, hey, I'll just come work for you for a little while and you don't have to pay me in order to repay my debt. Or in some cases, people would say, hey, I'll become your servant to a wealthy master because I'm gonna have, you'll provide a house for me, you'll provide meals for me, and you'll educate my children. And so a lot of people in, in this economic system were really well-educated, even though socially they were considered slaves. But even then, in the situation where there's this economic uh, thing happening, there's some economic regulation that's occurring over this, Paul says, and he writes to Philemon, and we'll see this, he says, hey, I'm sending back to you somebody who's your slave, servant, bond servant. I'm sending him back to you, and now you, Philemon, are going to have to wrestle with the fact that this guy, this servant, bond servant, is now a brother in Christ. How, what are you going to do? Are you going to let your brother in Christ be your slave? And so the economy was transformed. The, the, the whole economic system was because the Christianity, Christians living in the world, decided a system where a person owns another, even if it's just an economic benefit, is a system that degrades the dignity of their humanity. And it, and it changed. Now, for it all to change, it took a long time. And there's a lot of places in the world that it hasn't, but that's the economy. So if Christ is preeminent over all things, we, we need to be willing to ask ourselves, you know, where are the areas of our current economic system that rob people of their dignity? It's a way better system than it was in the first century because of the influence of Christ and his preeminence in the world. But that doesn't mean it's perfect. Education changed. Education became something that was available to everyone, not just the elite or the wealthy, through Christian day programs. If you look and you know the history of education in the United States, right, it changed. Like, the, the major universities and schools started as a result of the church because the church said, we need to know what's happening in the world. That's why Abraham Kuyper, again, to quote him, he, there's, he said, uh, there's no such thing as neutral education. He said, as you, you're either going to teach your family, your children, yourself through the lens of God's preeminence, or you're not, but you can't have it both ways. Either Jesus is preeminent over all things or he's not. The government change, it's not a coincidence that the governing system prior to the coming of Christ was brutal, and it was just people taking over, and it, and it was you know regimes that would come, and whoever had the biggest military, and now in most places in the world, there's some form of democratic system. People's perspective on life in the world changed. The world I mean, you look around at the world and people say, the world looks like it's going nuts. And all those things we read about in Revelation, talking about, you know, what the future could look like. We got wars. We got rumors of wars. We got natural disasters. We have, you know, 100-year flooding, that sort of thing going on. You know, we have, we have a, a pandemic, you know. It's a bit of a problem. We have, like, essentially a civil war going on in American society, not one where we're fighting each other with weapons, but one where we're fighting each other with ideas. And Christians are like, we're doomed. And I get it. I get the we're doomed. Oh, oh, oh well, sorry, world. But Paul says, look, the world might look bad, but here's your assurance. Jesus, the preeminent one, is holding all things together. So how will we live? As individuals, as a church, as we reflect on the world, who's the one in charge? Who's the one who is preeminent? 
Paul says it's Jesus. What do you say? That's the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we scratch the surface of this teaching on your preeminent son, Jesus Christ, that our lives, our community, our world would be transformed. That we would look at the world not as something that is to be thrown away, but something that's to be transformed. That we would not be discouraged by how far it seems we have to go, but encouraged by how far we've come. Father, be with us, especially as we respond, as we go out into this world. Be with us, Lord, in all that we do.